Good morning, everyone, and welcome back to day two of our Indoor Chemistry and Environmental Justice Workshop. We're so thrilled you're with us today and excited to continue our fascinating discussions and hearing from our wonderful speakers on the second day. On the first day, you heard about indoor chemistry in all its complexity and forms, including indoor air issues, indoor dust and chemical products and consumer products, and how structural factors such as racism and discrimination lead to disproportionate burdens in communities of color, in different populations, and how that is a health risk that we are concerned about. Um, today, we have a very exciting talk from Ruth Ann Norton, who's the president and CEO of Green and Healthy Homes Initiative. Before I go on to introduce our speaker of the day, I'm just going to give you a quick overview of the plan. So basically, we'll have a talk followed by a Q&A with our speaker for today, and then we'll have a panel discussion with our planning committee and hopefully all our speakers from today and yesterday and all your participation live. So we would really love to hear from you. We want to push the conversation forward to action and solutions. Um, just a reminder, so we are focusing again on housing issues, consumer products, health risks and exposures. We had some discussion on governance and regulations and what do we really need to make a dent in the space, right? To change actual outcomes on the ground. How do we engage with communities? How do we do work on the ground that benefits communities and prioritizes their needs, not the research, let's say, or the proposed solutions? Um, if you are online, as a reminder, please post your questions in the chat and we will be looking at them and, and pose, posing them when the time is right, of course, in the session. And if you are in person, please feel free to come up to the microphone in the Q&A time, and the National Academy staff will help you pose your question. So with that, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker for today, Ruth Ann Norton. Ruth Ann is the president and CEO of the Green and Healthy Homes Initiative. She joined the organization in 1993 and has led its development into one of the nation's most effective and foremost authorities on healthy, healthy housing and its impact on the social determinants of health and racial equity. An expert on lead poisoning prevention, healthy homes, and the intersection of climate, energy, and health, Ruth Ann directs GHHI's national strategy, policy framework, and services to integrate climate, healthcare, and healthy housing as a platform for improved health, economic, educational, and social outcomes for low-income communities. She broadened the organization's mission by designing the GHHI Comprehensive Model in 2009 in partnership with HUD and CDC that is built on a framework of cross-sector collaboration. GHHI's model aligns, braids, and coordinates resources to comprehensively deliver lead hazard reduction, healthy homes, energy efficiency, and housing rehabilitation interventions. She has been at the forefront in building the business case for healthcare investments in housing to address the social determinants of health and racial equity. Ruth Ann serves on many boards and committees, including the EPA Children's Health Protection Advisory Committee, the National Leadership Academy for Public Health, the John Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health Center for Population Health Information Technology Advisory Board, and she is the chair of Maryland Lead Poisoning Prevention Commission and a federally appointed liaison member, the CDC's Lead Exposure and Prevention Advisory Committee. Please join me in welcoming Ruth Ann Norton. Thank you very much for being with us today. Welcome to the Q&A. Yes. Fantastic. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm really pleased to be here. And Gillian, I want to just give you a special thank you for inviting uh, me to talk about the work of GHHI. And as I said, talking about uh, our work uh, in the context of indoor chemistry, my parents would be proud because I struggled so mightily on the sciences growing up. So. Um, but I'm an economist who ended up in a public health uh, mission. And I want to talk to you just a little bit about GHHI before I talk about our work. 
Uh, we describe our work as addressing the social determinants of health, opportunity, and racial equity through the creation of healthier homes. But in 1993, we decided to form an organization to move forward the vision, the work, and the brilliance of nine parents in Baltimore whose children had been severely poisoned by lead, who were spending 28 days getting deep muscle injections and chelation to remove lead from their bodies, only to know that the housing stock to which they were gonna return was likely to poison them again. In 1993 in Baltimore, we, if we put the threshold of 3.5 micrograms per deciliter, the CDC threshold for lead, Today, we would be talking close to 60,000 children at the time being impacted by lead. So that toxic legacy of lead poisoning that was keeping black children in Baltimore especially from being able to get to the classroom to fairly compete, to learn so that for a lifetime, they would be able to earn and have a quality of life. That really was not an option. I, I was tutoring kids at the San Fr uh, Franciscan Youth Center at the time that we decided to move this forward. And what I noticed was that the children who were eight and nine years of age knew, they knew that where they lived was determining the pathway of their lives. And the hope that that was taken away from that and the opportunity taken away from that was the reason that we founded on a social and racial justice mission, the coalition against uh, to end childhood lead poisoning. But we also did it because we knew that we had to improve from a standpoint of a moral compass, housing condition in the United States in low income communities that we had disinvested, that we had disregarded, and that we had allowed ill-conceived policies and practices to really rob people from the long-term opportunity to have a quality of life, to have health, and to have a forward-thinking future. So we have moved that mission forward over 30 years, being investigators and science, scientists in a, our own kind of way with our co-principal investigators and our lead investigators being the parents themselves who are living and understanding the challenges and complexities of not only lead, but radon, asbestos, the carbon uh, emissions and benzene that are, in, that are in their houses every day and impacting the health of vulnerable children, pregnant women, seniors, and all, all of the folks living in these houses. And what keeps us up every day, every night, right, and challenges us every day are the 34 million families that live in unhealthy homes in the United States that are full of toxins and chipping and peeling lead-based paint, but also mold, mildew, and moisture from leaky roofs, poor, poor ventilation, and the carbon emissions that are coming from their stoves and their heating systems, but for which families often have to depend on for heat in the winter when the electricity goes out. What we today are looking to try to do at GHHI is to flip that script, to take what we know informed by residents, informed by communities, and move from historically disinvested communities to the most resilient leaders on climate-friendly, healthy, and safe housing. To turn the $150 billion that we spend, that we don't have to spend every year on medical issues and health issues caused by unhealthy housing and reinvest that as opportunity for the future to train people in community to be the risk assessors, the data collectors. I was so impressed by Paul Francisco's presentation yesterday where he talked about how, and many of the other presentations talked about how do we build that 
together. People first, the science follows, right? And we have really endeavored to do a couple of things. Have the courage of common sense, which I think comes because the evidence is there and allows us to do it, but also help to put the value of doing what is doing the right thing. What do we save? What can we reinvest? And what we have focused on a lot is the healthcare system. Because we know if we invest in lowering the rates of asthma, in reducing mold, mildew, moisture, doing integrated pest management, improving ventilation, lowering carbon emissions, not only are we going to have dramatic impacts like we've shown through our Healthy Homes Technical Studies and, and great organizations like RMI and others have shown the reductions in asthma, right? But we know that that child's gonna get in the classroom healthy and ready to learn. And in the case of the healthcare investments that are made in our Baltimore program, we will lower, we will create savings for the healthcare system. So our main investor in Amerigroup, now WellPoint, by investing money with GHHI to do this work, to address those things that are making kids unhealthy, they in turn showed that we can serve, save about 32% per patient per month in their costs. That becomes a business case, but most of all, a human case for opportunity. And our HUD studies showed that we will reduce hospitalizations by 66%, and more importantly, improve school attendance by 62% it is all tied to our quality of life. But it also comes, we moved from the coalition to end childhood lead poisoning after achieving a 99.4% reduction in childhood lead poisoning in the most poisoned city in America and returning $44.5 billion in economic investment back to the city and the state. Uh, that comes from a study out of Duke University out of the Nicholson Center. Uh, it must be valid because I went to Chapel Hill. So if they're going to say something nice about people who went to Chapel Hill, that's good. But the reality is we started to look at what that meant. Where did the $44.5 billion of economic investment go? Did it go to holistically improving housing? Did it actually go back to families who had suffered these injustices? Did it fund college educations? Did it fund healthier housing? And the answer was no. So we really started to hone in on how do you track those dollars from an equity standpoint, ensure that they're getting reinvested? How do you track savings, ensure they're getting reinvested, right? We, around social determinants and social drivers of health and equity. And what do you need to make that happen so that the contractors doing the work are from the community, but they're not just also the contractors, they're the owners of the contracting companies and taking and looking at that, right? So we really started to unpack, how do you leverage investments from all of the 242 lines of funding in the federal budget that actually touch housing intervention and how is that tied to evidence-based practices how is it tied to reducing toxins and improving housing condition? So that's been our work to look at those things, both in our direct service programs, which we have in about seven cities across the country, and in our capacity building and technical assistance work. And today, we have probably the greatest opportunity that I know I will see in my lifetime about how do we leverage the historic investments coming from the Infrastructure and Jobs Act to put money into what we now call Justice 40 communities, but the communities that we have left disinvested for far too long? And how do we use the monies from the Inflation Reduction Act to do something really important? And that is take the climate dollars that are being put out in various forms in the billions of dollars and turn that in a way to have restorative justice and health in housing. 
and to ensure that we're going to our hardest hit communities, that we're not bypassing the capacity building needed, the jobs improvement needed, right? To address what we are doing so that we can actually take that money and put into housing where 40% of the pollution globally is attributed to buildings and much of that residences. How do we address the 34 million households and families that wake up every day be, uh, uh, less prepared because their child didn't sleep through the night because of asthma, may have been damaged because of lead poisoning, or where they are struggling with their energy bills. And, and we have this opportunity now to align, braid, and coordinate these dollars so that we really can reach a moment of equity. For those of you who have been in this work for a long time, I'm, I was talking to the presenter from WEAC yesterday, Peggy Shepard and I 30 years ago in this fight, we were sitting on some pretty lonely islands and we do feel, I think many people, that the tide is finally coming to the shore, but we have to build on that. We have to take the opportunity to treat housing quality in the United States for everyone as a matter of health, of racial and economic equity. We have to ensure that we address the fact that 61% of black and brown Americans are more likely than white Americans to live in a county with heavy pollution, including particulates coming in from smelters, right? And what's happening in their home and how do we combine those activities really grounded in the one place that can give families security, can give them an opportunity to succeed uh, and build some housing stability in communities that are much, much healthier and safer. So one of the things today, in addition to things like lead and trip and fall injuries and asthma uh, from other sources that we're looking at is the mechanical appliances in homes your water heaters, your dryers. And that is being taken forward in lots of uh, zero emission uh, proposals for mechanicals across many states, including a paper that'll come out next week uh, in Maryland that GHHI is a part of to talk about how do we set a standard legislatively to say no more, are we going to do that? The one issue um, that we also are pursuing whether it's more politically viable or not, never stood on political viability, stand on evidence, stand on facts, is gas stoves. We know that leaky gas stoves can cause respiratory impacts, neurological impacts, can uh, really be quite damaging, right, in someone's life. But it's also for many low-income families the appliance that they've hung on to for heat, that it culturally in many traditions, right? Cooking on gas, cooking on flame, really important. So how do we change that socialization? How do we build confidence in the electrical systems and houses, the electrical grid so that we can make people safer? But we have to. We know that these noxious fumes in houses are exacerbating asthma, are causing neurological impacts, and are causing those things in life, right? Asthma is the number one kid, the reason kids miss school. It's also the number one reason parents miss work. And it's a, and eventually what we are also concerned with, as more and more and more people rightfully move away from fossil fuels, that is happening so much faster in the middle and upper income communities. And this time we are committed to ensure that lower income communities will not be left behind on a gas island to pay the bill that makes them unhealthy. So we've done some really interesting things, including building community advisory boards to help us as we did when we started the healthy homes work beyond lead to move to healthier housing. How do we inform people? How do we teach? How do we have the communities as leaders to understand something that meets great resistance? 
And yeah, how do we take even the utilities across the country and get them to do the right thing uh, by families? So we're working on that. And we're really working to try and align this opportunity with communities on an energy, health, housing, and equity standpoint, right? And there's a, if you want to read a little bit more about sort of how this work happens, Dana Borland from the JPB Foundation wrote a wonderful book on the intersectional crises that we face between climate, housing, and health. And I would really recommend that. But we see climate change and the dollars coming as maybe a pivotal and seminal moment to actually improve housing stock greater than we ever have. That we can shift from disinvestment and those ill-conceived and unjust policies, whether it's redlining, which I uh, hate to say began in Baltimore, Maryland, right? whether it's that disinvestment that occurs because housing is bad, so we're gonna disinvest more, or we're gonna build the highway through a community and increase asthma and disenfranchisement of families, right? So we're gonna shift from that disinvestment strategy and do the things that are also common sense ma measures. I think somebody yesterday talked about something that I think is always a point that we have to solve for. In communities across America, 52 to 62% of the time in, in especially larger urban centers, weatherization and energy efficiency dollars that are intended for our lowest income communities are deferred or declined or never invested because we're not taking care of the toxins in housing because we're not taking care of the health and safety in housing. And we have to do that. But when we do it, uh, we did a study for the Obama administration. And when we do that, we can move from that 52% deferral rate to a 92% uh, success rate, right? And that matters to the quality of life and health and how the rest of the home as an envelope works. And we have to take that same view in the climate dollars, where we ensure that the contractor companies are owned by community, that the risk assessment and data collection is done with community, led by community, as I said, right? The, this working together, building a whole house model, a holistically healthy homes model is the pathway forward. And we know that it saves about 26% for governments when they do an integrated strategy, which means for every four homes they do, they can do five, right? It means that workers cross train will start at about four to $8,000 higher than those who are individual uh, skilled, right? And we have that opportunity. But we also have to measure what we do, measure the health outcomes and take those savings back to healthcare and urge them in the reinvestment strategy, whether it's Medicaid or the state health departments or hospitals like Lancaster General Hospital, part of the University of Pennsylvania Health System, who in Lancaster, Pennsylvania is investing with GHHI, $62 million collectively in the city of 90,000 people in a county of 500,000 to make housing lead free, healthy, and with the whole house bill passed by the state of Pennsylvania that looks at how do you build all of this together with energy and climate, we can have an entire community of healthy housing. It's the same approach now that's being taken by the state of Maryland under the Moore administration, a whole house strategy, and so many places like Built to Last in Philadelphia, because they know that it's not only economically viable, it's better for uh, wages and wealth, right? But it improves the health of communities immeasurably. So we, we have healthcare investing all over the country, right? But we also have really good utilities who understand this and are thinking uh, progressively like Detroit Energy, who's a, a co-investor with us in the 
uh, Detroit Home Repair Fund that's funded, uh, led by the Gilbert Family Foundation. That, so that work and that whole house strategy matters. But I, the reason we began it, I'd love to say it was completely on the evidence, but it wasn't. It was in part that, but it was mostly family members saying to us that when we originally did the work on lead, that we would leave and there were still so many other things that were harming their lives. And we had, a, I have a worker a colleague uh, on my, our team, Larry Brown, he, who's worked with us for about 22 years. And Larry and I were um, sitting in the office and he leads our construction work. And he came in and he said, I can't do this if we're going to just replace windows for lead and do chipping paint and know that so much else is happening in my community that we're not addressing. So we started research and we started small. We started building $10 radiator covers because 1,300 kids in Baltimore were going to the hospital with second and third degree burns because of radiators. Then we started a little bit of pest management. Then we started to learn about indoor air quality. Uh, and we started to build that strategy around healthy housing and one day at a time, pulling one thread at a time and listening to our lead investigators, the families, we began to come up with the theory of what the work we're doing. So we address in our work, lead, asthma, injury, things like radon and asbestos, energy efficiency and weatherization, and electrification and decarbonization. And one thing I will say for electrification, besides helping to prevent fires, it also adds value to housing. And in all of this, as we build and track the dollars of equity investments, right? And whether they are real investments of equity, electrifying housing is also often improving the value of homes. And one of the things that we have to close in this country is the eight to one gap in intergenerational wealth transfer by real estate between the black community and the white community. The chasm is really wide and often because we've undermined the investments in housing in black communities in this country. So this is our model of the line braid coordinate, right? Where we are bringing in philanthropic dollars, private sector dollars through healthcare utilities and uh, private, uh, private investors and leveraging the federal, state and local money so that we have one comprehensive assessment all set in evidence, right? And was co-created with HUD and DOE and EPA and CDC. And that we are using that then to look at scopes of work and where do we braid money from? How do we coordinate resources? And how do we track that data uh, with community on the outcomes? And how do we share that transparently uh, with community? So our whole house approach, right, has had some pretty good outcomes, 66% reductions in hospitalizations, as I said, 62% improvement school attendance, 88% of our parents report being able to better get to work because their kid's not in the emergency room, not in the hospital, sleeping through the night, not having other problems related to that. And our uh, cost savings for energy, really quite uh, good as well. So I'm gonna kind of go past this because I know I only have a minute or two. I'm happy to talk about the really, I think, interesting things and broad things that GHHI does in Q&A. But as we measure this work on the racial equity metrics of community engagement, where's the data? What are the lessons? Who's leading? Who's getting those dollars, right? We look at how are we also meeting those climate goals? How are we moving forward things like zero emissions in appliances, electrification standards? But most of all, how does it come down to families? So this is Corliss Billups, longtime public servant, worked in the state's attorney's office in Baltimore, and at the age of 67, was about to lose her house. Her energy bills 
were high. She did not have working mechanicals. She had asthma and asthmagens in her home, a little bit of lead in her house, and was fearful for her grandkids to come into the home. And she was looking at a future about how to afford to move out of a house she could no longer afford or maintain. So we took a whole house approach with her uh, in the past year and, and included in that full electrification, full decarbonization, replacing all of the those mechanicals. And in the first several months, her utility bills have dropped. She reported in a lunch, $120 a month. We have $100 a month here. But most of all, she feels better. She's stable and she has a home in, in which she can age gracefully and with health and into the future. And is now, I think, our biggest advocate for induction stoves as well. But we also have Cameron, right? Who even would, who suffered greatly from asthma. And we this is not a home where we did the full approach, but even the smaller things of addressing housing to improve indoor air quality, to ensure that there are measures to lower the asthmagens and some of the toxic air uh, issues, and has moved from multiple hospitalizations and ER visits to none. And we have hundreds of these stories, right? As we build on the capacity of communities um, to go forward. So I wanna say, the last thing I wanna say is there's a lot of GHHIs in the world that exist today. We started one person and a budget of $17,000. And today we are doing extraordinary work, but there is extraordinary brilliance in communities across this country that we cannot, should not overlook. In March, we held a, de a decarbonization electrification convening around healthy housing in Baltimore with 85 groups from around the country that need real investment because what they do and what they will do is far better than anything that we have ever done to date. So thank you for having me. And I guess we're gonna do a little Q and A and uh, if you have anything to, to ask, but most of all, I'm grateful to you. I was so impressed with what I saw yesterday and, and uh, what I'm gonna be watching more of the recordings, but to do the brave work that you do and to wanna to translate that into environmental justice, we need more of that every day. And to you, I'm grateful. Thank you. So what are we doing? Very much, and that was fantastic. If you don't mind joining us at the panel table. Okay, I'm gonna take my- Sure. Okay, so I know who I am. Okay. Yes, um, that was really excellent. Um, please. Hour of Q and A with our glass of wine or something, right? And I have plenty of questions. And again, I'm super grateful to Dr. Gillian Middlestead for really being the connect, bringing us together for this call. Don't mind. I'll start us off with a couple of questions that I have for you, and then we can also check online to. So, well, I have I have a lot, and and. What a wonderful presentation. All our discussions today and yesterday and just hearing talk, I feel like there's a little bit of a disconnect perhaps between the research, right? And I can see Gillian is, is agreeing with me. In the research community, we're moving a lot more towards, or we're getting signals from our funding agencies that let's think of solutions more solutions oriented. Let's think of how to make a difference, right? Oftentimes you're kind of thinking of one type of intervention or focusing on one problem and trying to devise a solution to it in the research world. And we talked about community engagement and we can get into that a little bit later perhaps. Um, whereas in your talk, I was very sort of fascinated and impressed by this whole home approach, right? This comprehensive holistic take on solutions and interventions and making an actual difference on the ground. So I guess from your lens and your experience, what are we missing in the research world with connecting with the type of evidence that you need, for example, 
to design these programs, to implement them. If you were to ask a set of researchers, can you show me evidence on X, Y, Z? This is the most impactful type of work you could be doing so that in practice, we can really make a dent in people's lives and health outcomes and environmental justice. What are those thoughts that come to mind? I hope I answer your question, but I have a bunch of thoughts going in my head, right? So I come Baltimore, right? Um, so many people know this box, right? And where research occurred uh, DNA and made dollars over the course of time. Sorry, am I, is that better? Um, I come from the city where lead studies left black children in houses while they got poisoned because we were trying to get information in, you know, the, the researcher trying to get information. Um, and that left deep distrust in a community. And, you know, I, I, at one point in time, when we were doing a big redevelopment project in the city of Baltimore, uh, we needed to think about how do we do demolition of these older houses that were full of lead and other toxins, right? And asbestos and other toxins. And how do we do that safely? So we had a large community meetings, right? And I remember that we invited not only Hopkins, uh, but we invited Morgan State because I wanted to build better trust with the community and have uh, Morgan State in. And what was interesting about the community in that, that I loved in the raw honesty was the, the pushback to bringing Morgan State in at the time, who has done just an amazing job on community health and has really changed the fabric of how we do research in Baltimore. But at that time, the community said, where have you been? You've been on your campus, right? Whether you're an HBCU or not, you've been on your campus behind your walls and you haven't been here talking to us. So it taught me a lot about not to make any assumptions. Um, but it, but all of it is that, that there is deep institutionalized distrust for a reason. And the ways that we've found to get past it, and we have, we are not the ones with all of the answers, right? Constancy and consistency. Uh, for my own self, the reason I've stayed at GHHI, not gone somewhere else, is because I made a commitment in 1993 to peace that I would be with them as as one person, as, as an ally, as a, a to do the work. And that builds trust to have constancy, consistency, and presence. But the other is to learn to invite community in early to understand what are the problems, regardless of any community, what are the problems that communities are actually facing? You know, whether it's the asthma rates in LA because the all the housing sits right next to the highway or you know, transportation issues or, or, you know, lead in housing, whatever that is, you got to do things that address what people are facing. And when you start, when they start to see success with what you're doing, they're more likely to be with you in the next step. But the other is to be uberly transparent. Why are you collecting data? What is the data going to do? What role can I play? And keep being transparent and keep sharing, even if nobody shows up when you do, because people know that you're doing it and eventually people come and join. Um, but you know, I think there are many amazing lessons to be learned from the WEACs and from the Chisholm legacy work and, uh, it, you know, and even the work that uh, groups like Elevate and others are doing around the country, right? You've got to build trust in that work. Um, I believe we have a question from online. Is that correct? Sorry, Dr. Nyon, we can't really hear you that well. Oh, okay. Thank uh, you. Hi. Um, this was a great talk, uh, Ruth Ann. I really appreciated um, the insight that you shared with us today. 
Um, I would have had a question regarding the current state of the housing crisis today. Um, given your extensive work throughout the years, what do you see as some of the challenges um, that the country is facing with this housing crisis, new families, trying to start a family, looking for homes, and even the homes that are affordable were built prior to 1978. How can a home buyer be confident that it's lead free if it's built before 1978? The realtor says, we painted over it. Um, but is that enough information? Just food for thought. Well, um, I would say follow on that issue, right, on lead. I'm really proud of the state of Maryland because the state of Maryland has said for, any, for rental housing and, and that has now kind of moved over into our real estate market as sort of a culture um, that we are going to ensure, right, that we are uh, having uh, advocacy always to lower the dust clearance standards that we're doing uh, with many others at EPA but every house will pass a dust test. It'll pass a visual inspection. And if that, on a rental side, right, if that doesn't happen, right, if if at any point in time, child has an elevation of blood level or there's chipping paint, right, or other issues that are causing paint to chip, peel, and flake, that we will automatically require that repair, that reinspection that we've made not following the law on lead, on, again, on the rental side, an illegal rental. So you can't go to rent court and collect money if you are not fully in compliance with the standards of the law, right? And we get, you know, we incentivize to get houses to lead free when we can, which is a harder standard to really dig in and uh, uh, get that done. Um, and we have really strict liability. We protect people in rent court and against retaliation. Um, but we've really had these aggressive embrace of standards, which I think go beyond just lead, right? If you commit to standards in housing that are evidence-based, right? Around those things around health and safety, and you have the courage to enforce them, and you will see things like that $44.5 billion economic return, but more importantly, you'll see the likelihood of housing stability, the likelihood of reinvestment, but, you, but most of all, you'll see that in attention, in health, in reading scores, in long-term earnings, right? And so that's what, Lancaster General Hospital, what they are doing, for example, in the 50 million of that money is on lead hazard, lead abatement, right? To make houses uh, lead safe and lead free. That actually does not come back in actual health savings to the health system. So if you if you reduce asthma, we can track that financially and that we can there's actual dollar cash savings. When you invest in lead, what you are investing in is life, uh, the quality of life, long-term health, right? Moving away from kids and adults exposed to lead will have a 46% a likelihood of early mortality, a 16% greater likelihood of cardiac arrest, higher rates of hypertension, all of things that we know burden, already burden communities. So it's, it's, the ability to have the standards, the ability to understand what is prevention versus secondary prevention. So prevention is take the hazard out of the house, remove the exposure. Secondary prevention is testing, really important. So we know where problems are, but where you have data, follow the data and take the action. Um, it's much harder to do in the homeowner side because there's harder uh, ways to enforce that. Um, and I do think that every ho house sold in America built before 78 should have to pass a, a lead dust clearance test and a visual standard. And I think it would be better for us if we did it. Um, but we do fight still today, the concept of property owner rights, 
about whether I'm going to do something. Uh, and the lead disclosure law in the United States, it can be argued as the encouraging people to be like an ostrich and put their head in the sand and paint over it and say they don't know and back away and we have problems. Um, but we have to be diligent also to make sure HUD, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, all of these uh, federally owned, insured and backed properties that we are not putting those on the market, right? Everything we can control from federal and state dollars has to have a standard because that's representing us, right? And the last thing we want to do, right, is to like say, you know, a family buys a house off the HUD list and then their, poison, their child is poisoned. So we use HUD money to go clean it up after they get poisoned. Let's clean it up before that happens always, right? So I don't know if I answered your question entirely, but we still have a long way to go in this country with as much success as we've had on issues like lead. Um, and it, it, we can't do it with both without two things, right? Community trust and the evidence, right? And those two things get you past most reasonable legislatures. Um, we do have some problems with some that won't be reasonable right now, but maybe we'll change those. Thank you. That wasn't a question, I know. Dr. Middlestead, please. Hi. I always have a question. Um, yeah, thank you, Ruth. That was an excellent talk. And I want to just try to drill into your legislative expertise and policy reform because that is the engine that we need. I, I would argue we have substantial amounts of evidence and overwhelming amounts of evidence to take action, right? Um, I guess uh, my question would be, so as an example, CDC's budget, as you know, for their asthma control program varies between 20 and 24 million. They've had anywhere between eight to 10% increases over the last 20 years of even having that program. Meanwhile, you know, you look up the pharma revenue from asthma control medications and it's about 40 billion a year, right? So our substantial disinvestment under investment in primary prevention or secondary prevention has has gone on over 20 to 25 years while the evidence and the ROI is more than well established. So if that's not enough, what is it? What are we not doing? What is the legislative strategy? I would love to hear your thoughts on that because I certainly don't know the answer. Yeah, I know. I, yeah. I keep, every time I hear things like this, I'm like, okay, I should give up what I'm doing and concentrate on that, right? Because, well, first of all, we need more people concentrating on these things because you're 100% right, the evidence is there. But I would say in, in changing legislative behavior on budgets, we have to convince them that it is will be it will help build success of things that they want and believe in. And one thing I think that we must do as advocates is do a better job of building champions like real champions at every level, not give up on any person um, that could potentially be a champion, whether you agree with them or not, whether they're in your political party or not. I know that's hard in this day and age, um, but find the reason that they may want to support something. And I got, you know, I got to tell you that all of the climate investments that we're making to electrify a house, to decarbonize a house, it can't happen when the house has the things that are sending kids to the emergency room for asthma, right? We have got to address the issues of mold. We've got to address pest management. We've got to address very poor indoor air quality uh, because if we don't do that, that will stop all of those electrification jobs. It will stop. If we don't fix the roofs of houses in America, we can't put solar on them, right? And so making those investments in health actually strengthen things. And we have to find a new way to talk about it um, in terms of how do we, how does that investment build the success of other programs? Um, and, you know, it's, I think in Congress, CDC is harder because it's not seen as direct investment. It's seen as surveillance. It's seen as science, which is always up for whatever reason up for debate. Um, 
and we have to make it more concrete in in ways uh, to do that. But something we should talk about and continue to do because, and we have to put the focus there. I think we we overlook CDC because we're so focused on DOE, we're so focused on HUD, these big behemoth agencies. And again, we've got to get to the things that make things work better. Good morning. Good morning. So it was already mentioned that there's very little coverage of this topic within the scientific literature in terms, and I've you know, done a search recently looking at lead remediation along with weatherization and it's pretty much non-existent. Um, so my question for you is, well, I also have a general sense that those things are highly decoupled within policy. There's a lot of lead policy. There's a lot of decarbonization policy. So if you were to develop kind of a policy agenda, or if you had it your way that you can um, attack these things simultaneously, how would you um, kind of formulate this? Yep. Um, and thank you, by the way, for the amazing, amazing work of WE Act, who I think should become the standard of everything we follow in many ways. Uh, uh, so I think we are taking that approach that holistic, healthy housing and the whole house approach is what we have to do, right? So we're, we now have 14 states considering whole house, right, uh, programs and policy and legislation. It is, it works on outcomes, right? It works on data. It works on saving money, right? Uh, and um, I always hate to say that because it's saving lives, right? That we need to do first. Saving money often talks louder. Um, but I think we have doubled down on the whole house strategy, right? We have doubled down to talk to agencies that I know you know well, like NYSERDA, and say you have to be thinking about health. And, and, or if you're the Connecticut Green Bank, you have to be thinking about health and safety. But a whole house approach um, is every single time will prove out. And I think we can move this at state legislatures in order to move the federal policy more. Uh, I think DOE is starting to understand that under Secretary Granholm that you have to do this important, what they call pre-weatherization work or pre-development work. Well, that is all code for health and safety, right? And uh, to do, so, but looking at the benefit of the whole house approach is big, it's large, but it is the courage of common sense and the data bears out, the human stories bear out. So that is one. We need to expand things at, uh, how we do the funding. We have a very small demonstration project that GHHI worked with Congressman David Price um, to get into HUD that is looking at how do you coordinate weatherization and lead, but it's only $5 million a year. And let me, I just wanna like on the issue of lead, let's just get real that in June of 21, HUD published this data of the 1.1 million lowest income families making $35,000 per household or less who had imminent lead hazards in their home, to clean that up is a $170 billion investment needed, right? But the way that we have done all of the billions, hundreds of billions around infrastructure and jobs and around Inflation Reduction Act, right? No money in that for lead-based paint, right? Lead-based paint in housing is still 84% of the problem of poisoning kids and damaging their brains. So we have a large case to make in that. And the reason we've gone after whole house is because, but we it's an opportunity to put the standards for lead eradication, lead exposure, and many other things that don't get direct funding, like asthma is such an incredibly underfunded uh, set of work on the intervention side. Um, but if we can hold institutions to their word on social determinants of health and social drivers of health, they invest in these things, right? But a whole house approach policy is what we are taking. It's not, doesn't, I'm not, not trying to simplify it. There's lots to do in that. Um, but all of the things we're doing if we bring them together and align them, braid them, coordinate them, right? 
we can we can tell you what the gap is in funding. We can drive that gap through healthcare reinvestment, through utility reinvestment, and through some private sector uh, uh, kind of good guy uh, reinvestment in that makes the most sense for families, we believe. I have a question online that I'll come back to, I promise. Um, and four minutes left, but I... Um, this holistic approach, right? And whole house, I'm thinking also whole economy, whole workforce development, jobs, right? We were having a lot of conversations yesterday with our planning committee and our speakers around these kind of looming issues with workforce development and training people to be able to take on these very important jobs, right? For weatherization, decarbonization, pre-weatherization. Um, what is your perspective on sort of how we're doing with training the workforce or preparing for what's to come and opportunities and jobs? I mean, the massive opportunity is if you want uh, to be an electrician or to be a plumber, right? If uh, thinking about electrification and decarbonization, and um, and how do we incentivize people to want to be the craftsperson of being that contractor, right? And we talk about contractors as the new face of healthcare because they're the ones on the front lines uh, doing a lot of this work. I think we are not hitting the mark at all on the contractor capacity piece um, and that we need to find ways to do that. And one of the things that we have to do is unions across the country, right, that are going to be the beneficiaries of so much of this work, also have to open up their resources on apprenticeships, on training facilities, on opportunities, much more broadly to black and brown communities across the country, right, so that we don't have uh, sort of people depending on uh, workers of color to be at lower wage jobs, less protected health-wise, right? And uh, and then instead that we are embracing people into the workforce to grow. So we have to we have to grow that workforce by giving the right resources, and we have to build those things in community that stop people from being the owners of contractors companies. So in every community. The community foundations, mayors should be thinking about how do we build an umbrella insurance ecosystem so that we can lower that cost of entering the business? How do we build a way to give money upfront for the capital needed to buy vans and tools and training, right? And how do we open those opportunities to the higher wage jobs? And it's there, right? It's there for the taking if people can access it. And if we support making sure that we you have to remove the barriers to build the workforce, right? And for all of you doing research, by the way, everybody find a great contractor. We have a guy on our, our uh, team, Brendan Brown, who was a carpenter in New Orleans, Katrina hit. And he decided after seeing that, that he needed to go to the Bloomberg School of Public Health, right? Um, and has become a, a great researcher and capacity builder around how do you put evidence into practice, right? So go find your local contractors. Um, but we, it's going to be incumbent, but it's also incumbent that we're building those community connectors, those folks who can help really explain data, who can be a part of data collection and risk assessment. I look at jobs like risk assessors in the Baltimore community that will pay somewhere between sixty-five dollars to $85,000 a year with health benefits. We have a mass amount of underemployed and employed individuals who within three years could be at that skill, that training and doing that work. And we need to go find that connection. Uh, all of us need to do that better. Excuse me, and I, I know we are at time. I'm just going to sneak in one quick question, if you don't mind, from online, and we'll need to move on to our panel discussion. Um, so Mary Patrick online is asking, in your whole house approach, 
how do you help people with multiple chemical sensitivity or has sort of your work addressed um, multiple chemical sensitivities? Let me make sure I'm also including, um, how do we make sure new homes are built with safe materials instead of cheap unsafe materials? Uh, and I know you've addressed the sort of legislation issues, but how do we get to new construction that's only done with non-toxic materials? Thank you. So a couple of ways, making sure your contractors are trained to recognize this, super important, that it's on the scope of work, right? And that as you are braiding the resources, resources are also the human capital resources that may address asbestos who are specialized in doing that and making sure that that's happening. Right, um, I, this idea of how do we change the standards of materials? Uh, I will say the, the Healthy Buildings Network, uh, the, the work they're doing is just amazing. And um, Jaina should be maybe your speaker next year on this because she does such amazing work. But I was at a conference of mayors meeting many years ago and the president of Walmart got up and spoke. It was being honored for Walmart leading the way on the adoption of LED lights in America. Because they just decided to move off of CFLs to LEDs that they completely changed the marketplace, right? We have to convince the Walmarts, the Home Depots, the Lowe's of the world that selling those products is the right thing. So we have to get to that supply chain issue and we have to build the case with them and we have to be talking to that, those entities um, regardless of what anybody may or may not think about them as a whole, they move the market, right? They are where the contractors are getting the materials. We have to work to make them price competitive and we have to get legislatures to really say, and this is, I believe deeply in the power of the purse of the federal, state and local agencies, they can set the standard. They can say, if you are gonna take our money, you won't replace a gas stove with a gas stove, right? You will change that. You will use materials that are less toxic, right? Um, but, you know, so it goes everywhere from the contractor training, how you're funding that scope, but we've got to change supply marketplace. Yeah, that viable. So much, Ruth, and we can talk for three more hours. I'm sure we really appreciate your time. Thank you for being with us. A round of applause, everyone. We are going to take one minute to transition to our next panel. Thank you so much, everyone. Please stay with us. Um, and I would like to take this time to invite Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Gillian Middlestead to please join us on the podium here. We have Dr. Heather Stapleton, who will be joining us virtually. And we have Dr. Ellison Car We all. Thank you so much. Can you, yeah. Um, sorry, we disconnected a little bit. So I'm just going to repeat that. We have Dr. Ellison Carter, who's also on our planning committee. Thank you so much. Um, joining us virtually as well. Please give us one min minute and we will move into our final session, which is our committee panel on next steps forward. So welcome everyone and thank you so much for joining us for this final panel conversation. Um, well, first of all, my extreme gratitude and thank you to Dr. Glenn Middlestead, Dr. Elson Carter, Dr. Heather Stapleton and the whole team for organizing this wonderful workshop. Um, we've had a lot of interesting conversations and talks from our speakers over the last two days. We also have online participation, we would like to invite you all to please join the conversation and help us to think about next steps and going forward. Uh, and perhaps what I'd love to do actually is give Dr. Carter an opportunity to, you know, reflect with us on her thoughts on some of the major themes, let's say, 
of these two days and knowing that you've been working very diligently behind the scenes. Thank you again so much um, to help us sort of think through how do we bring this vision forward. Thank you, Rima. Um, I'm hopeful that you can hear me. Yes, and if you don't mind just speaking more into the microphone, if possible, I know sure. it's hard, but we've been having <laughs> no. some audio issues. Thank you. No, um, no I've, I've really appreciated the range of presentations over the last few days. And I know um, both of you and, and Heather have worked really hard to bring in some great speakers. Um, I think we've learned a lot. And it, uh, throughout the course of the workshop, um, we've, you know, shared notes, I think, on things that might be emerging, um, topics that came up across presentations, um, and maybe also some observations that that we've had as we've put this workshop together. Um, I think I can summarize a few themes that came to mind and then maybe see what makes sense to pursue um, as conversation. Um, it, starting with, um, in no particular order, but I, I think four or five themes um, came to mind um, as I've been listening. And you know, one is scale. Um, I think rightly so, there's been some great examples of how this work gets done, um, models uh, or templates of, of how others would like to uh, address um, health in housing and particularly around um, the products that are brought into those homes that contribute to chemical exposures, as well as um, sort of this the systemic uh, structural features of, of homes that, that lead to long lasting exposures that are harmful to health. Um, I think as the issue of scalability or, or taking a model and replicating it has come up, I think there's also been some really interesting discussion around uh, what motivates that drive for scale and whether scaling is something that's warranted. So I, th I think that's something we could have a discussion around what kinds of activities maybe warrant scaling, which ones don't, and what criteria might inform a, a decision to try to take things to scale or not. Um, I think something else that's come up across multiple perspective or multiple presentations has been um, what are the hard to reach perspectives? And I think that's varied with the presentation. Sometimes it's um, the households or families um, that are maybe more difficult to reach or have been um, harder to engage with. Um, but I also think there have been a few presentations that have highlighted um, maybe the lack of insight we have on perspectives, say, from contractors or insurers. Um, and so thinking about what barriers maybe limit involvement of those hard to reach perspectives could be a thread for discussion here. Um, a third theme that I think has been very pervasive is the uh, idea of governance. Um, there's been discussion around standardization, certification, regulation, who makes decisions in the indoor environment. It varies by who lives there and who owns a property. Um, timing of decisions, when are decisions made, especially those that are less reversible or maybe even irreversible. Um, so maybe thinking about as a group, what, are, what have been some examples of good governance for indoor spaces? What would good governance look like? Um, it seems unlikely that you know regulation of indoor air would look like regulation of outdoor air, but maybe thinking about what those models would look like if we if we tried to standardize um, or or regulate uh, spaces where people have historically experienced really harmful exposures. Um, maybe I'll I'll and I'll raise just two more. Is that okay, Rima and Gillian? I don't I don't want to drone on. <laughs> The, the other topic that, or other theme I think that has arisen um, as I've been listening is that of complexity. Um, you know, indoor chemistry has been referred to as complex, indoor environments have been referred to as complex, and then solutions um, have been referred to as complex. I think a few people, um, Gillian and Paul come to mind, I'm sure there were others, have mentioned that, you know, if we were to walk into a home and not come away with 50 to 100 things that could be improved, then maybe we're not looking closely enough. But that it's a fairly complex 
set of solutions then to address harmful exposures in indoor environments. And so um, I think what's come to my mind is uh, maybe a somewhat, um, it's probably not that radical, but it feels radical to say like, what if we never took another measurement? Like, what is the role of measurement moving forward? Um, I, I don't mean to suggest we don't need it, but um, what needs to be measured and what doesn't need to be measured? What do we know enough about to uh, move forward with solutions? Um, and then a final theme that seems to come up repeatedly is who does the work? Um, this could be in the form of, you know, what I think Ruth Ann was really, you know, much more eloquently than me commenting on sort of the need for um, scaling the practice of building and ensuring healthy housing. Um, I know Paul also referenced these topics and so did others. Um, so that kind of work, who's doing that work? How do we build capacity there? Um, I think I'm also curious about uh, the diversity of experiences that people have had in communities uh, where, um, you know, including my own experiences where in some communities, members have really wanted to be engaged in the work of learning about their environment, interpreting data, developing solutions. And in other cases, that's not been where people's interest has, has been. Um, and, and I think that heterogeneity is, is okay. I think maybe trying to understand um, how to gauge that level of involvement and then how to you know, accommodate changes in that level of involvement. So, thinking about who does the work and, and how partners have engaged um, you know, successfully over time in learning what the level of resident involvement um, may need to be or, or what's desired. Um, so those are some of the reflections that I've had over the last, I guess, day and, and, and a little bit. Um, maybe I'll turn it back to you, Rima, to see, or Killian, to see how you'd like to proceed with the conversation. Also happy to revisit any of those if helpful. Much, Dr. Carter, um, Dr. Middle. I first, you know, I just appreciate. I thought that, but Ellison, um, when do you have any online specifically? I want to just. I have some summative thoughts as well, but I want to first just see anyone here in the room um, or anyone online in response to the excellent summary that was just provided. Um, I was actually not, not texting with a friend. I was texting a colleague asking for her questions. And, um, I will say, so she has been a trainer for my organization for now. She's a general contractor by trade. She is an architect by training. She helped build the American Lung Association's Healthy Homes Assessment Program. So, you know, almost hitting every point that you would need to be, and she's an outstanding trainer. Um, but she has also noticed that you can have your train, she trains hundreds of people effectively, but without the policies and legislation, there isn't going to be a requirement to put in a higher level of standards for retrofits and upgrades, right? Or she, or there may not be for new construction. Um, and I will say, if she were here, the other thing she would say is she has worked for years with the green building movement. And it's fantastic that we have LEED certified buildings in green building and Energy Star. But have you ever looked to see how many of those are applied in low-income housing, right? Um, EPA's Indoor Air Plus is an outstanding program as well, but it's really painful, I think, for both of us to see middle and upper income, especially upper income homes, built green and highlighted, and they're this shining standard. I don't think they have set the ball rolling down the hill. I think they just now happen to live in an incredibly contaminant-free, well-ventilated home. Um, so I am just wanted to share something um, about her experience and thoughts. Anybody Thank care? you so much, Dr audience online much here to to discuss and perhaps going back to the issue of scale it's fascinating to me it's almost like we have some these circular ideas sometimes right is well how do we get there we need to scale up maybe we don't right Paul but um 
you know, to do that, we need to train the workforce. We need to change business models to kind of create the demand for these holistic kind of, of approaches. We need to create jobs. We need to provide the evidence and the data and the science. And then again, I keep going back to this sort of disconnect between it feels in, in my world, at least where I sit, you know, day to day in research and getting to implementation and practice, right? Um, I feel like we're missing that link to make a real dent and scale things up that way. Um, I'd like to provide an opportunity for Dr. Neon um, to please chime in. Uh, thank you, Rima. Um, I, I had a question about the report. Um, going back to the report, um, Why Indoor Chemistry Matters, uh, as being an integral part of writing the report and putting it together, how do you think this report has helped move the needle in the space on what do you think could be done further? Thank you for that question. Um, Dr. Carter, did you hear that question? Would you like I, me to repeat it perhaps? Yeah, would you mind repeating it? I heard part of it, but not the whole thing. Uh, so I think it was really for the committee and the you know study members that worked on this report. Um, you know, how has uh, its impact been, especially the focus on environmental justice with it? Um, you know, why did you choose to work on this report and how have you seen it sort of have an impact in this space? Perhaps I'll start us off with a couple of ideas. I think I was honestly um, you know, very encouraged by just seeing it referenced so many times in my, let's say, scientific circles um, with Dr. Miriam Diamond at another meeting, actually, with Dr. Dodson's talk, with so many talks in this space. Again, I feel like the issue of the indoor environment and indoor air has been so perhaps neglected relative to outdoor air and the conversation there that this report has really helped kind of bring it back to the forefront. Perhaps it was well-timed during COVID and all that increased attention. And I know the work of all our speakers in that space that really helped kind of catapult this forward. But I also feel like, you know, our committee coming together to really put our brains together and review this evidence you know, the charge was to really think about indoor chemistry, right? And, and even using the word chemistry sometimes can be scary to the general public. And I, you know, from my perspective, I've said this multiple times, sometimes we talk about chemicals and that implies risk, right? But that's not necessarily true because a chemical is a chemical. That's just what it is, right? So these concepts of human exposures and disparate exposures that we really brought out in the exposure chapter that Dr. Carter led and environmental justice concerns and how that leads to health risks in the general population, but also in disproportionately sort of burdened communities. I think we really did a great job in sort of integrating the bigger picture with the science and the chemistry understanding of the complexity, right? So to me, that's what I'm very proud of and, and obviously learning from my colleagues is that we sort of went from deep down chemistry and <laughs> analytical issues and sources and complexity to human exposures and health risks and a path forward and a vision forward for this field and the space and why we need it. And I'm especially proud of these dissemination workshops that we're working on. I'd love to give my colleagues an opportunity to chime in. I um, I appreciate what you're saying. I, I think it's uh, it's a great question. And I two responses. One is that it highlighted that the indoor air chemistry, indoor air field in academia and healthy homes practitioners um, are not as integrated as we could be, right? And uh, we. There's those doing field work and research and publication and interventions. And I was surprised during the development of the report how much I would learn. And I thought I'd read the literature, but I didn't really understand where the tr trends and themes were in the research community. And I think vice versa in the healthy homes, and which is why I appreciated being able to invite several of the speakers who are here today, because I did want, I do see in the literature 
the gaps in understanding about real world conditions sometimes and not from anyone published in this, <laughs> you know what I'm saying, but you, you do see it and you can't adequately characterize indoor air chemistry if you don't see the overcrowding, a home where you step through the floor because the mold is so significant, um, you know, just roofs without pieces on them, like those need to be measured just as much. So um, I think that's just my, oh, the other thing I was gonna say is going forward with this report, um, the indoor airfield, I've worked in it since I personally was in a building that was contemned um, and I was made very sick, premature pregnancy along with all the other women. And that's how I ended up in the field. Um, I don't think that we can go forward right now as far as we've come that the, the question of what if we took no more measurements like that data is so important for EPA and Congress to move forward but do we need like partitioning was fascinating to me and understanding that and that will help with regulation of chemicals but I also feel like we're working on the tracks and there's a massive train coming, which is the climate events, the heat and the smoke events, right? We're about to have a massive destabilization of society, our economy, and potentially our food systems. And yet now all of a sudden we do have money to do cooling, some filtration. So while we're here working on the tracks and collecting our data on efficacy um, and this train is coming, how are we gonna graft ourselves onto that? That report is one way of saying, here's accumulation of the evidence and the data gaps, and I think it will help. So, that's points. Thank you. <clears throat> Paul, please hold on to your question. Don't go away, but I just want to make sure, Dr. Carter, did you want to add anything from your personal perspective on the report? Oh, in response to Linda's question, um, I, I think, you know, both of you have covered some of the greatest strengths, I think, of bringing the people together that were a part of forming that report. Um, I think one thing that I had hoped for, and then I think did seem to come to fruition, is that by permitting us um, the opportunity to interpret our charge perhaps a bit more broadly than we you know, needed to. So, the, you know, the way these reports are designed, there's a charge and it sort of specifies the scope of what we will cover and also sets a boundary on what we won't cover. And I think as a group, um, we all wanted to see environmental justice intersect with indoor chemistry. And that fit isn't you know, necessarily um, one degree of freedom. And I think there was a lot of receptivity to how can we bring these concepts together in a way that's still consistent with the charge? I think that um, you know, was a positive ex experience for, for me and ho hopefully others. I think something else that came out of that because that was an early decision to make this its own chapter is that I think um, people from different realms of science saw the value of learning from other realms of science. So learning about interventions can indeed be informed by understanding partitioning um, in certain contexts. And at the same time, interpreting complex indoor chemical data can really be informed by understanding people and what makes them you know, act the way they do in their homes. Um, and I think, um, being able to work on those intersections for you know quite some time and and assess evidence from these diverse realms of science, I think also um, put put that those pieces of evidence on a, a similar level um, with one another, and I think that was a really valuable outcome. Hopefully, that has come through in the report. Um, that'll be for the, those that use it to decide. Uh, thanks, Rima. Um, so much, Hello. Dr. Carter. Um, please, Paul Francisco, question. Thank you. I'm not sure if this is a question or a comment inviting reflection. Um, but so this session right now is really about next steps forward. And I'm kind of wondering next steps for what and for whom? Are the next steps for research and researchers? are the next steps for outcomes for residents? 
Um, you've talked about scaling. Honestly, I think that scaling of research is not what we need to do. Just doing the same project in a hundred different places with a hundred different researchers is not, it stops being research. Um, but broadening and expanding research, there's still a whole lot of questions that we don't know. So is it next steps forward for broadening and expanding research? Is it next steps forward for delivering outcomes to these EJ communities that this workshop is about? If that's the case, then in a lot of ways, there's a lot of things we already know enough about and it's time to start doing things, stop researching it and start doing it. And so then what is our role in doing that, in, in giving the information to others who can use it and helping to establish regulations, policies, programs. And you know, we're never, the research community is never gonna be able to serve all the needs for that. We have to give it away to other people to do it. So is it next steps for that? What are the next steps for? Very much, Paul. I, uh, I just want to say that I deeply appreciate what you're saying. Um, I think it's sort of a, a an excellent point in time question to ask in our field. Um, I didn't finish it, but there was the book by and about Dr. Paul Farmer, Mountains to Mountains. I'm not sure if any of you have read it. Um, but one of his quotes that I kept on my wall for a while is, was, he was attacked by kind of the press and agencies at one point, international aid agencies for saying something somewhat similar. He said, I just said, we have the data. So now what? You know, his point was, want us just to keep collecting data? Because we can, but we're at a point where we can use this, to not just implementation, but to actually have systems change. So you don't have to implement. Intervention means there's already a problem. Right. <laughs> so the idea that we keep developing interventions is so I, I think it's it's poignant and um, a fundamental question that you've you framed here. And I do I just want to add to that. I mean, I completely agree with you, and that's kind of what I'm taking away from these two days of our conversations, right? I definitely think you know, research and science are very important, and there are questions that we still don't have good answers to, or like the example Dr. Carter gave about how just understanding partitioning behavior itself might really lead us to figure out more effective interventions to do things. That said, I do really feel like there's this big gap between sort of the research community and the practitioner community. And I honestly, like completely honestly, did not realize this before this workshop. And that's why I'm so happy to always be learning um, I do feel like we need the path forward needs to be exactly what you're talking about, Dr. Middle said, and how do we make a dent in interventions and changing outcomes on the ground, right? I feel there's this great push in the research community to be more kind of solutions oriented and you know intervention focused. Um, and that is great but it's also sort of not everyone's skill set in a way, right? So I feel like there's this a little bit of a disconnect between, you know, just the conversation of what is that science that you need to be most impactful in your work, right? And going back to the research community and educating them as well, you know, on sort of how can you broaden your horizons to be more connected to the real world problems and, and make a dent in things. I know this is getting a little bit philosophical, so I, I apologize <laughs> for that, but I, I do really struggle with that idea. Even what we were discussing with sort of community engagement models and frameworks to do things, we heard from amazing speakers who are all experts in the space, right? But even the words community engagement in a sort of a practice type of setting are different from in a research study and the funding models are different and the institutional barriers for being able to do it well and maintain it and sustain it are very different. And so that that's a little bit where um, I feel the pain points are and where this conversation is really helpful for us to bridge these gaps. Paul, please. Thank you. So you made the comment that there's a big gap between the researchers and practitioners. And 
I completely agree. And that's yeah. one of the things I've tried to do is is be that be a bridge in this space. Um, doing that in part by training a lot of practitioners, but I'm also I have a job that lets me do that. I think one of the problems is we in my talk yesterday I talked about we have to value communities. We also have to value the researchers and give them incentive to do this work. In my opinion, very few researchers are incentivized to connect with the practitioner. And if you don't have an incentive to do it, if it's not valued by the organizations you're working for and the systems you work in, you're not going to do it because that's taking away from doing things like new research, students, papers, things like that. So if we want to move from knowledge generation, which is, I think, what research is about, to knowledge transfer, which is not what research is about, we have to empower and incentivize researchers to start engaging in knowledge transfer. I gave some examples of how would you value communities? How could you be valued like reference letters from community leaders? Maybe, maybe if it, your faculty, maybe you can swap out a semester of teaching college students for a semester of teaching practitioners and have it be equally valued. Um, I don't know if that's the right answer, but I really do think if we have a role in the knowledge transfer, we have to be incentivized to do that. And if we don't have a role in the knowledge transfer, we gotta figure out somebody else to do it because it's only gonna scale for solutions if that knowledge is transferred. 100% agree. And I do think that's a fundamental problem and maybe take a semester off and not teach practitioners, but go learn from practitioners, right? Um, Linda, if you don't mind, we need a charger for the laptop. Thank you. And I'll go to the online questions in, in a minute, but um, sorry, before we go to Dr. Dotson's question, did you want to comment on this, Dr. Middlestead or Dr. Carter? Uh, I will just say my colleague is, um, yes, she said, you know, invite researchers, bring them out into the field, she said, out of the office and into a crawl space. <laughs> so, but I will say that the other massive piece who is not in the field is the federal agency staff. If you've ever noticed, when we invite them out, they come out for a field trip once every two to three years and maybe see two or three houses. They don't see the conditions. And you know, we just did a massive health fair for a community that's impacted heavily. And they brought a PowerPoint and you can't bring a PowerPoint to a community that's impacted by smoke and pesticide spraying and poverty and rural dust, you know, and it was, and they're very well intended, but the point is, is they thought that you were going to have sort of a, a professional forum, right? As opposed to engaging just with that community. So yes, great. Um, Dr. Carter, did you want to add anything? I think I just want to affirm Paul's um, comment is if we think about next steps, it needs, we need to be specific about next steps for whom. And that doesn't mean one group at the exclusion of another, but um, I think that if we're speaking from a researcher perspective, I do firmly believe there are some very high systemic barriers in academia to aligning the work that needs to be done if we want to do work for people um, with the incentives that that engage researchers in the process to begin with. So um, and I think it does actually connect to a question that's online, but we can come back to that. It sounded like Dr. Dodson has a question. Um, I, I think there's a question about building relationships and longevity particularly for your early trainees. So maybe we can come back to that after the in-person in question. Thank you, Dr. Carter. And thanks for saying that. Actually, if you don't mind, we're gonna need your help moderating some of the online questions because sure. our laptop here died. So we're gonna no we'll come back to you. Yes. And I want uh, to tell um, our online audience, we are seeing your questions and we're gonna get to them for sure. Please just bear with us a few more minutes. We'd love to hear from Dr. Dodson in the room. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So I'm sitting here kind of thinking about why I do the research I do um, and the impact of this report. And I I have a couple of 
thoughts, and, and I'm thinking about how I do this research to characterize what's actually happening indoors, how I think it's really important that, and I think something actually the report did very well is this acknowledgement of like, you can have a, um, a perfectly built indoor space, but then you introduce a person and things <laughs> get really complicated. And that I think is super important. We can't think of things as static. Um, and how we can take that information about what we know from our research and inform practitioners and, and, and help communities. And I see that as kind of trickling that information downstream, which I think is hugely important to have an impact. But I also want to put forward that I think as researchers, we need to also think about how our research actually should go back upstream um, and have the impact back up there. We can have wonderful programs um, that, you know, like Paul leads and GHHI leads. And I think those are wonderful of getting into homes and, and figuring out what's going on in homes. Um, and those are hugely important, but people can only do so much um, if they still, they have no option but to bring in toxic products into their environment. Or when we go in and we do all this rehab work and we put down vinyl flooring everywhere because it's highly, re, you know, resilient, um, and we're not thinking about the fact that we just introduced a whole suite of other contaminants into the home. Um, yes, we've addressed some other really important things like lead and pesticides, but wow, we've just you know introduced flame retardants and phthalates and a suite of other things, PFAS, things like that. So anyways, I think that what I, I guess what I'm trying to put out there is I think as researchers, we need to think about implementation. We need to think about how we translate to practitioners and to, into communities, but we also need to do our research in a, in a in a space where we're thinking about how it can actually inform and gather the evidence that's needed to go back upstream. What are the things that need to happen in the, say, the building certification um, programs um, around material safety? What are the things that need to happen around even just the cleaning product industry and what chemicals can be used in cleaning products? What about all the furnishings? What about all the personal care products that we're bringing into homes? If those are toxic, they will contaminate the indoor environment. Um, and so I do think that we need to think about the regulatory and the policy levers upstream in addition to the downstream impl you know, implementation. Well said. Um, yes, thank you so much, Dr. Dodson. Um, I, I think you said it perfectly, and I'm not sure I have an answer for you, but I, I do appreciate you kind of sharing your insights with us. Um, Dr. Carter, do you mind helping us with some of the online questions? Sure. I'm happy to help. There are uh, a number that have come in. Uh, I'll trying to summarize, there's a few that have some overlapping themes, but um, maybe to pick up on the I, I think uh, something that would be applicable to a range of, of people listening in um, is a question um, from Colin Bremer that asks what advice would um, maybe panelists and speakers have for graduate students or postdocs who would like to break into this space um, but may not be in a place long enough to build the kind of relationships that we've been referring to here or maybe limited in their ability to allocate their time. I'm, I'm paraphrasing here a bit, given the um, high priority on publishing in order to uh, you know, complete their degree program and have a competitive you know, faculty application. Um, I'd like to maybe expand the question a bit beyond just graduate students and postdocs and, and early trainees and maybe say, you know, for those that are not necessarily in a position or feel like they're in a position to build those long-term relationships, um, you know, wh what might be some strategies or what, what have people done in order to um, sustain relationships even when the level of commitment is varied over time. So I think there are multiple people in, in the room, um, including you know, both of you that could maybe respond. So happy to turn the mic over. Dr. Carter, and if the panel doesn't mind, I'd love to just share th some thoughts on this because I really do appreciate this question. Um, and I, I see it a lot with a lot of our um, trainees and in my personal sort of professional journey, 
I do think that's another systemic barrier, right? And the way sort of our education models are built. Um, I lately have been encouraging and we've been having these conversations with Dr. Fabian too yesterday. You know, my students or prospective students wanting to join programs to really look for those interdisciplinary programs. I'm not minimizing the importance of depth in your field, but we're in a day and age, thank you so much, where um, it's really important as a scientist to be very good at your field, let's say, or really understand sort of the depth of the topic you're in, but to also know how to talk to other scientists and practice and translation and all that. So I, I do think some of the most wicked problems of our days. And if you guys know this reference, it's really sort of for the need for transdisciplinary science and research, right? We use these words very lightly or interchangeably, but they, they mean different things, right? Going from multidisciplinary to interdisciplinary to transdisciplinary now, right? I think our educational systems are perhaps catching up and there are some great examples out there but really putting students in very inner or multi or transdisciplinary settings where you can get your PhD or your early career training in this topic you're very passionate about, but also learn to hear from and interact with and talk to other disciplines and understand how the language you use is perhaps not the same as the language they use, but there's a common core to everything we're trying to do here, right? So. So that that's one of my thoughts on sort of how to balance all this. And I think, you know, it doesn't necessarily come with a laid out program per se, but some of it could be individual sort of, um, you know, drive or, or trying to pursue these kinds of training opportunities. Maybe that's enough. I had more thoughts and perhaps, but I do see Paul and... Dr. Fabien in the room, so please chime in. Okay, thank you. So I have um, kind of three thoughts on how to uh, help promote. Um, how about this? Okay, it's just it probably gets higher, but I don't know. Um, so three thoughts on things that uh, students can do to build some of these connections. One, go to a practitioner conference. There's the HPC Home Performance Conference every year. The next one's in April in Minneapolis. 2,500, 2,000 to 2,500 practitioners talking for most of a week on a whole range of building science, healthy homes, um, resilience, electrification, all kinds of stuff. Go there and learn. Go to everything you possibly can and learn from the people who are doing this every day. It's yeah, it's a few days, but it's only a few days in an, in an entire graduate program. There are some, um, like from the Building Performance Institute, there are knowledge certificates. You get a you get a certificate. It's like two hundred and fifty bucks for the book and the exam. Go through and learn about building science. Learn about healthy homes principles. Um, again, it's a little time, but it's only a little bit of time in the context of an entire graduate program. Uh, the third would be find your local weatherization program. You know, the DOE's funded weatherization program serves every county in the United States. And find the local one and see if they let you shadow them for a few days and see the work that they're doing in the housing that they're doing it. I don't know that they'd be willing to have you shadow them, but ask, because they are going into houses every day trying to figure out how to solve the problems we're talking about, and they're specifically working in these communities. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paul. Uh, and actually, if folks don't mind indulging me before we go to Dr. Fabian's question, the part two of what I was trying to say is that sometimes it feels like science and academia are very sort of individual focused, you know, your career track and your success and so on and so forth, uh, and your publications and all this, whereas really we work in teams now. And I feel like, you know, there's this reactionary kind of 
sense in the field of no, you need to be doing this. No, you need to be doing that. No, now you need to be like an implementation scientist. Now you need to be doing community engagement. And the reality is none of us are all these things combined, right? I learned from my colleague, Dr. Jill Johnson, who's an expert in community engagement every day. I'm not the expert, right? But I think other than transdisciplinary learning, also learning how to actually do team science in a respectful kind of collaborative way. I think that culture in our training programs in academia needs to change and evolve sort of with the times to get us there, to even know how to do team science. Because at the end of the day, to build and sustain these relationships, it's going to take a village and a team and not a single person can sort of be all those skill sets or be good at doing all these things combined. This is my personal opinion, I have to say, not a, an academy's standpoint, right? But I do think this is like the underlying, you know, challenge in a lot of these conversations. Dr. Fabian. Thank you, Dr. Haber. I just wanted to actually build on what you were saying and offer some practical advice. I offer my trainees and then for the postdocs or sort of early uh, scientists on the call. And that is that community engagement doesn't start when you start a research project. And you can do community engagement even if you're in a transitional phase, such as a postdoc or a doctoral student, because community is where you live. And there's uh, environmental justice communities everywhere that you live. And there's lots of opportunities to engage. If what you're interested is in education, sustainability, there's all the energy and sustainability committees that towns have. Uh, you can be part of a committee, you can just attend the public meetings, and then you get a sense of what people care about, uh, what they're talking about, start to learn the language and how to um, try to connect all the sciencey jargon language that you have with uh, language that people might understand and even want to hear about um, beyond sort of what you uh, think is important in your research. So I think um, if community engagement is part of one of your goals, that doing that at the smaller scale of doing it in your community and just attending meetings, that's a pretty low ask. Um, committees meet once a month. If I think about my town committees, you can just sit there and kind of listen to, to what people care about. And then once you sort of move into something um, that's more permanent and you need to build relationships that are around a community engaged research project where you will be in the community, you know, uh, being there in person, et cetera, you've actually sort of built all those skills along the way um, and set yourself up to be more successful. So that's it. Thank you very much. I'm sure our junior trainees and attendees really appreciate this advice. Um, I have something to add to this conversation. So we use a lot of graduate students when we do our pilot field work and you know, we might be setting up a network of purple air sensors, which is probably the most common thing we might be doing, or um, distributing our toolkits to households. And we will use them mostly on the air quality scientific side to help with collection of data. Um, but it's such a win-win because they get work in the field and they're out there and then they go on to, and we also tend to introduce them to then the state and local agencies and the community groups that we work with. And I will say that at least two interns in academia who we have used, I believe are now working at our Department of Health. So in, instead of going into academia, and not that I'm advocating for that, but that they saw a different pathway to apply their training. Um, I just have to add one other thing. So we're talking about ways to get researchers out into the field and hearing the real barriers that we don't understand in academia to that. Um, I was talking about federal agencies getting out into the field, but the other big piece that's not in the field is have you ever seen a physician or a clinician in the field? Yes, community health workers and community health aides and promotoras, which is fantastic. But you know, the number of clinicians I talk to who truly don't grasp what an environmental exposure might look like on a daily basis in someone's home and therefore don't treat their patient, don't screen their patient for it, um, to me is a massive gap in our system. Because if, if you are not being told by your healthcare provider that you are exposed in your home to something, or that your health conditions could be mitigated by retrofits in your home, are you really going to believe it? Maybe, 
But right now we still have this sort of heavy lean in our society towards if my doctor isn't going to validate this, is it true? Right? So anyway, that's my two cents on that point. So much. Sorry, Dr. Carter, I can't tell if you could hear me or not. Um, A, if you have any thoughts, we welcome them. B, could you please help us moderate the next few questions from online? And I also see Dr. Diamond's hand up. Thank you. Yes, I let me, because there have been a number of questions that have come in as much as I actually love to keep talking about um, engagement and ways for people to do this early in their career. It, maybe it's something we can come back to if there's time. Um, there have been a number of questions um, or comments that I, I think I'm going to synthesize as relating to um, perhaps regulation. You'll forgive me for those that have made these comments. If I've misrepresented your, your perspective, um, please follow up and I'll, I'll try to do better. But I think there've been a couple of comments related to specific hazards such as artificial turf or um, lead in, in products that are upcycled or recycled, um, lead containing building products um, that can uh, be reintroduced to indoor environments through regulatory gaps. And so I think these, these comments and questions sort of intersect at the point of regulation. And I know there were several people um, who gave great presentations, um, Jill Johnston's is coming to mind, but I know there were others um, related to um, pollution through broadly defined consumer products. And I, I don't know if we could spend a little time thinking about what does it look like to um, engage um, in particular with that sector, um, people who are making decisions about regulations or, or regulators themselves. Um, and I think this connects with another comment um, by a, another audience member indicating like, how do we, if we have the data that we need, how do we translate that into regulatory action? Um, so I, I'm hoping that that's a fair synthesis, uh, but I think that's the spirit of the comments and questions. Um, audience, uh, ask that question. I'm I'm thinking back to Ruth Ann's comments, to be honest, and how sort of it all connects together, right, from markets and creating demand to providing policymakers with the cases they need to make that align with causes they care about, sort of packaging that all up. Um, I do feel like the comment, Dr. Carter, that you communicated is is maybe perhaps more from a researcher perspective, but I, I think it's the theme that I'm seeing from all our conversations is really we need to be more integrated across these spaces and break down these silos of how we even think and function and operate within our organizations. Um, you know, I know historically we've all been in these conversations where researchers worry about sort of the advocacy hat, right, versus the I'm a scientist hat, and I don't think we need to get into these conversations today, but um, I'm, I'm really hopeful that with all the conversations that we've been having, that researchers have some clear examples of how they can actually engage with their community boards, with town halls, with policymakers to push things along. And I, we've seen great examples from all, all the speakers, right? Um, I do. So perhaps, I don't know if you wanted to add anything no, to that. No, I'm good. And we've got Dr. Dotson in. Yes. So um, perhaps if you don't mind, Dr. Dotson, give us one minute to go to Dr. Diamond online who has her hand up and then we'll go to an in-room question. Thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity to contribute again. I have a couple of points. And first of all, again, congratulations on, on putting this together. Uh, my first point is that I think we should be very careful about calling for more research when more research isn't needed. And in fact, it's implementation. I, as an editor, I see this all the time. Um, and it can be, it can be, re it really can shoot us down because we never seem 
satisfied to have a sufficient amount of information to move forward so that certain elements can take that um, and run with it. Um, I also, as an editor, I encourage all of us to avoid hyperbole um, uh, it, when we talk about the urgency of various uh, issues. The second point I want to make, and this really follows up with the need for integrated research, is the need to do research on solutions. So what actually works? What strategies work? What what uh, what solutions work? So you see this more in the medical field with and um, uh, with uh, outcome based research of, for example, with medical with um, medical policy. Show us the policies and figure out you know what those outcomes are. So I think that's that's very that's very potent. The, the parallel would be attribution uh, science for climate change. I think we could take a, a attribution science has been really important in moving forward the climate change issue, not far enough, but anyways. So I think we could take lessons learned from other fields on what's, on, on what's effective. My final point, um, is what I made yesterday, even uh, as I spoke too long. And and it, Rima, it speaks to your comment about um, should we be advocates? So I work I work in an ecosystem. I work uh, with uh, non governmental organizations. I hear what I hear what they need. I support them in their work by giving them advice. I will be a talking head for them if they want. I try to have a, a bit of a firewall so that I maintain my position as a scientist, even though I'm short and, and a woman. So that's like always a problem to establish authority. But anyways, not going there. Um, so I work with the media a lot. Um, and they are my they are my best friends. Uh, well, they're not my best friends, but I work with them <laughs> a lot because they're constantly having questions. And they're a great, um, it's a great connection to move this, to move our science forward, to make it publicly available. Uh, so those are my notes. If I were to redo my career, uh, which is not happening, but anyways, I would focus more on solutions, on what those actual solutions are, rather than ad nauseum of diagnosis. Let's just measure more. So, okay. Thank you very much for this wonderful workshop. So much, mm -hmm. Professor Diamond. It's just wonderful to hear your wisdom. And I could not agree more. And this is direct evidence to all our junior audience members to hear from the most successful researchers in the field on impact and career choices and you know how you in your own role can be very effective and can support right this larger mission and can find your niche and how you can be you know a valuable contributor thank you so much Doc dr miriam uh, very appreciative of your participation and your wisdom sharing these two days thank you so much we have a question or a comment from dr dotson in the audience please go ahead Sure, I guess this is more of a, a comment. Um, first of all, one of which um, Dr. Ryman just said, and it's another short scientist, I understand um, <laughs> that sometimes it's hard to get the attention, but um, the point that she made about actually, you don't have to be the advocate, but if you have partners who are advocates, you can do your research to support those um, and working closely with um, those people who do that very effectively. Um, there are NGOs out there who's, you know, working very hard to implement those policies or change policies. Um, and so talking to them, figuring out what information they need. Um, I also, to get back to that earlier point too, about um, how, how to affect policy change, um, I think one way to do that perhaps is to actually design studies that are doing that explicitly, right? So we talk about solutions-oriented research around mechanical interventions or something like that, right? But, but what if the actual, the research question is around the outcomes related to a particular 
policy itself. That would provide evidence that I'm sure lawmakers would sit up and, and listen to um, is if we tweak or if we um, if we redesign our studies slightly to be explicitly trying to address policy concerns or, or questions. So much and, and I do, you know, I just want to highlight again the comment that Dr. Diamond had, which is understand your role in the ecosystem. And if you need to have that firewall to, for you to be effective in the role that you do, that's fine, right? But 100%, you could be, you know, we, we all can't be everything, right? Or each of us can't be everything. Uh, I think that's important. Um, I do, perhaps we go to Dr. Carter online because I know we have a great conversations online and some questions that are coming in that we can take and then we have some more thoughts to share. Um, thank you. I I do think that, um, let's see. Oh, a question that I'm, I think I overlooked earlier that, um, or a comment that I would like to bring up because I think there are a number of people here who um, would have uh, insight or reflections on this. Um, Debbie Bennett uh, posted a comment that one challenge in upgrading, um, uh, they specify privately owned apartment buildings, but um, maybe I I'll take the liberty of expanding that, you know, upgrading properties in, in general um, may uh, occur and coincide with an increase in rent. So retrofitted housing, um, which continues to be in demand and may increase in demand, um, can, is costly and that cost can be uh, passed on to the occupant um, to either cover the cost of the retrofit as well as acknowledge the increased value of the home. And I know that there are a number of Again, people in the room who've already presented, um, sometimes this is presented as a split incentive um, it, that if the retrofit is made, then the cost is passed on to the occupant, or instead the retrofit is not made because the benefit is passed on to the, to the occupant and not the person or property manager um, making the investment. So I wonder if um, those in the room might speak to this um, split incentive or this difficulty in uh, who pays and, and how those costs get passed uh, around. And I know, I think Ruth, Ruth Ann was mentioning work uh, and somebody yesterday, I apologize, I don't remember who, was mentioning work on sort of mitigating this risk. Um, and, and maybe there are some other perspectives that, I, that I'm not having come to mind, sorry. <laughs> Um, I don't know, Paul, if you have any thoughts on that too. Um, it's an incredibly significant question because it's a force that happens in many of the communities that were have been impacted for 40, 50, 60 years by redlining that are gentrified, right? So when the retrofits and upgrades, and then that drives out those who make a living wage and it drives out the communities of color. So I, I think you've, uh, whoever posed that has raised um, an, a, a spot on question. And I don't know, and one of the things we see in our work quite a bit is that people who go buy, who are able to buy a home and become a homeowner, even at the lower income level, they're often buying a home with a legacy of substandard issues. And then so they might be able to afford barely the heating and the energy cost to operate that house and to pay the mortgage, but um, to actually do the retrofits and upgrades themselves, they don't. And the list could be very, very long as the amount of work that needs to be done to that house. So that would just be my observation to that. Yeah, so a couple of thoughts. One is this is sometimes where programs can come in. You know, DOE's weatherization program, they do work on rental housing. They require that the benefits convey to the residents, but because the program is paying, well, oftentimes there has to be some amount put in by the landlord, by the property owner, but of course it's gonna be a, just a fraction of what they would have to do to do it themselves. So they do get a significant improvement to their property for a fraction of the cost. 
and, uh, and because the benefits have to convey to the resident, often it comes with like for the next two or three years, you can't raise their rent. So that would directly address that. So to the extent that programs can be leveraged to ad address some of this issue, I think it's good. I think another thing that I don't know if there probably has been research done on this. I've heard about this issue. I don't know how well it's been studied is just when you have better uh, better rental housing, you have less turnover. And there's a big cost to finding a new tenant because the last one left. And where you have greater retention of tenants because they're happier with the building, they feel better in the building, they're healthier in the building, there's a cost savings there that could at least partly justify those expenses. It's, like I said, I don't know what degree of research there has been, but I've certainly heard about that being something that there have there are landlords that have done interventions to try to make healthier buildings that have then seen increased retention of tenants. And that's been part of their business case, whether it actually pans out, I don't know. Was from Dr. Debbie Bennett. Dr. Fabian, would you yeah, like to go? Can I just add a couple of comments to that? Um, one is that this is in some ways a short-term problem, right? We have a goal to get to net zero by 2050. Most states have that, or a lot of states have, have that uh, reductions in fossil fuel emissions by 2030. Um, specifically, I can talk more about Massachusetts because that's where I live. But that means that all homes will be electrified by then. So it's not a, a goal that we're working towards in 100 years or 200 years or just in general, the way that we've been working so far with weatherization programs. So it's a short-term um, problem to solve. So things uh, like the Massachusetts Clean Air uh, Center, they're trying to figure out how to incentivize landlords, uh, incentivize apartment owners. There's a, you know, a fund of money for triple-deckers right now, for example, uh, trying to figure out how to decarbonize homes and get to electrification. And part of that conversation is, okay, well, then how, how do you get the rent not to increase, et cetera? But maybe just returning to the fact that doing something like rent control in, for a very short period of time, when those uh, retrofits happen, that could be a solution for, then all the homes will be retrofitted pretty soon, right? Theoretically, but that's kind of what our goal is. So anyway, just wanted to point out that it's this unique point in time where we're all racing to get to electrification and all these things about who pays for what um, have to be both solved quickly and can be solved with short-term policies because we'll all be there by 2030, 2050. But to add, um, I don't know if I said this in a conversation last night at dinner or yesterday, but I want to caution when we use the drive for electrification, because even that in and of itself is a little bit of a, it's absolutely fundamental from an ecological perspective, but using the term is, is also sort of progressive, educated. Much of the West Coast, rural communities, cold climate communities, tribal communities are already electrified. That's all they've had. They have not had gas. They've had maybe some propane. So, but so that isn't driving electrification, isn't a major issue. It's air sealing, uh, insulation, weather, other weatherization factors, reducing a wood burning appliance that's used in the front room with wall heaters in the back. So you have a massive temperature differential. You got PM in the main room and mold throughout the back rooms. So it's, you know, and their energy costs have been somewhat lower in some places because of high, affordable hydroelectric power, but they also see significant um, changes. So I just want to say electrification. Um, yeah, anyway. Thank you so much for that perspective. And Dr. Carter, if you don't mind, just a couple of thoughts from in the room, and then we'll go to you as well. Um, so we did also want to ask the audience these few questions, and we would love to hear from all of you. Um, and actually, before I ask you these questions, I also want to quote Dr. Diamond by saying, perhaps we need to use the word allies for scientists, meaning allies of NGOs, media, um, groups of practitioners, et cetera, if you are a scientist kind of thinking of how you fit into this whole ecosystem, you could be a very um, powerful ally. 
in this mission. So some questions that we had for the audience that we'd love to hear from you on before we go to Dr. Carter, what key messages did you take away from this workshop? And what did you perhaps hear from yesterday's discussions and today's discussions that might have surprised you? What are your thoughts on how indoor air should be governed, if any? Please think about these questions and chime in. We'd love to hear from you. And feel free to use the raise hand feature and we can spotlight you. Um, but Dr. Carter, over to you. So I, I've i been trying to look through the Q&A and um, I think another comment that came up that maybe overlaps with some conversations, but I did want to highlight from Mary Patrick, um, who's provided a number of interesting comments and questions. She notes um, environmental justice requires action um, and that we've seen the need um, for data is great. The question is how do we translate the research to education and then action, which has come up a number of times. But I think in particular, um, this comment that she left that says environmental justice means telling the funders it is time to shift the money from research to addressing indoor air quality and building healthy housing and schools. So I, I do think maybe I'm revisiting this because I think Dr. Diamond, I, you know, appreciated your comment about being careful about whether research is needed or implementation. Um, I think what comes to mind with a comment like this is that the funders that we are referring to might be quite diverse. I don't know if people can comment on the diversity of funding. So if I think about federal agencies that have typically prioritized fundamental basic research or novel findings or new contributions in the research realm, even they are starting to want to see more community engagement and yet they haven't released the calls from wanting also novel contributions to research. And so that's one set of funders that I, I think we want to see maybe a shift from, but I, I wonder if maybe we can open this question up to, you know, are there some funding mechanisms we haven't discussed as much or what would it look like to um, nudge traditional funders in, uh, in more radical ways towards funding implementation work? So I'll maybe open that up to the field and I think I've already editorialized enough. I should stop. <laughs> Thank you for the question. Yeah. One of the, I think the funding question is, you know, the pervasive persistent thread through across every conversation today. I can't speak for academia, but as someone who runs a very small nonprofit organization in one corner of the United States, um, funding, scenarios currently are getting better because we are working with the energy sectors and with healthcare and with housing and threading those. That's fantastic. But the other reality that persists, and I don't want to use this platform today, just talk about all that is wrong because we're talking about what's going forward. But I was very struck to hear Ruth Ann Norton's, you know, outstanding work and the, the, the progressive work of the organization, the impact they've had, but they're an outlier. I don't have a $17 million budget. I don't get $25 million grants. I don't get a chance to talk to legislatures regularly. You know, we're working in the field. We're trying to affect policy. My organization's budget might be two or $300,000 a year unless we get another big grant. But to even get that grant then takes about 30% of our time to write the reports and management. I'd say 70% of my time is just managing the money we get. So. Other part that struck me when, when she was speaking was a reminder that all we talk about collabor collaboration until the cows come home, to use a very old expression, but all the healthy homes and organizations that I work with, we might have a coalition, we might have a meeting, but then we're all competing. We're all on the phone the next day, texting and calling for the same pot of money, and we will only selectively collaborate because we need to fund someone we just hired, right? So there's a lot of competition still at this, you know, sort of almost bottom feeding level of the smaller organizations that don't have adequate funding. So, yeah. 
point that out. That's exactly why I'm I'm so you know grateful for these amazing conversations because again we're bridging worlds. It's you know in research and the funding spaces that we think of completely different world than exactly what you're describing. Um, and I you know what also struck me and something I think about a lot lately is um, in this space you know weatherization preparing for climate change the idea of resilience and not in the biological sense, let's say, or the community social sense, but really in the, in a world where the climate, you know, climate change is creating all these frequent massive weather and disaster events, right? When we are thinking, again, this whole house approach was really impactful to me from Ruth Ann's talk, right? But when we're designing these solutions and interventions and programs, are we thinking of the plans B and C and D in the unlikely but very likely, sorry, unfortunate but very likely event when you have multiple things happening together, right? How are we moving away from, let's think of one problem at a time to fix it in indoor environments with multiple problems at the same time, right? Um, you know, I hope just the funding landscape, the research landscape, the practice landscape is also thinking of these sort of multi-pronged solutions to things. And I don't know that I have enough experience to talk to this, but I, I'd love to hear people's thoughts on it. So I'm just going to add a comment um, again here from my colleagues because the chat looks like it's closed, but that they note the other theme that we've hear, heard throughout the day that I don't know if any of us know quite how to tackle, but the concept of regulating the indoor environment, right, um, is a very complex one, but that the agencies that currently regulate chemicals, and, and you may see this in, at least I do with EPA and FDA, is that if they had more authority and more stringent standards to help develop and implement regulations, they are historically underfunded agencies, however, by Congress, right? And that is one of the ways that if you are a conservative legislator that you can hamstring an agency is by cutting its budget. And you know, to give you an idea, EPA is at about 8 billion a year, HUD is about 40 billion a year, DHHS is 400 billion a year. And so when we ask EPA to do more, there is only so much they can do because they are truly chronically underfunded on purpose so that they can't do enforcement necessarily or can't do more promulgation of regulations. Any additional questions or thoughts from our audience online, from our in-room audience? We welcome um, any of your sort of perspectives, especially our speakers from today and yesterday. We'd love to hear from you. What are some challenges that really stood out to you, you know, after hearing all the talks these couple of days in your own work, in your own space? Carter, I don't know if you can see anything on your end. I don't see the same view. Um, nothing that I haven't, I think, already uh, addressed. Go to Dr. Nyon, please, go ahead. Uh, I guess this is more of a general question to the speakers and um, our workshop planners. Um, what is one thing that you would do differently tomorrow based on what you heard today? I think I'm going to go um, look up contractors, first of all, but also really talk to practitioners in the field and try to understand, you know, and sorry to take over the, the conversation here, but um, I think in my research world, we talk a lot about community engagement and community-based participatory research. And again, Dr. Jill Johnston is really my idol in the space, and so are our speakers. Um, but I think I just love to learn more about the world of practice, right? I thought I knew, but I my eyes were really opened in this workshop. And then also figure out how in my own institution and sort of, you know, professional life, I can make space for 
carving out some more impactful, maybe research work that I could be doing mission. I will say very quickly that I actually did my dissertation on asthma coalitions and the concept of putting coalitions as a powerful engine that can cross sectors and cross disciplines and can engage all strata and the power of a coalition because you have community members sitting at the table and side by side with regulators and researchers and practitioners. So for me though, the question is, I, I would like to see this particular conversation continue where we have a some kind of forum where the indoor air and academic research fields can continue to have this conversation. I, I also see that we always approach gingerly the idea of regulation and then we retreat because we have our full-time jobs and because we have families and lives. But I personally don't know how we can get the, the steam to make a collective effort because I think to advance that dialogue at the federal level will require all of this phenomenal knowledge, but to be brought into one powerhouse and an advocacy type of setting. So I would invite anybody who wants to, I don't wanna say join me, I'd like to say join us presumptively, um, but to create some something that comes out of this that says, you know, what is not being asked, you know, and I, at the federal level right now, how can we come together and create a message, a policy platform for we should, you know, federal agencies should fund comprehensive analysis and assessment of what an indoor act would look like. I would love to see the Clean Air Indoor Air Act or Clean Air Act amended or Clean Indoor Air Act in the United States. It's a long time coming. But who's going to do that, right? We actually need a, a coherent group to move that conversation forward. Yeah, so I think um, for me, one of the things you know, I, I have, like I teach people about healthy homes and I do it in kind of this whole home holistic way. And one thing I do talk about, but I've learned a whole lot about in this workshop is about chemicals that are in various products. I mean, I, like I said, I do talk about it in cleaning products. I'm one of those people who had no idea that people were sticking mercury on their face to make their skin lighter. Um, it's actually, I find it kind of horrifying. And you know, I stand up in front of people and teach them about all this, all these different things. And I never mentioned anything about sticking mercury on your face because I didn't know it was a thing. So that's one thing I'm going to do different is start teaching people don't stick mercury on your face. Um, but <laughs> I think also, yeah, I think one of the questions that I have is, is also you know, with all of these products, when we talk about not necessarily personal care products that are at some level optional, I think there's a regulatory thing there in terms of the products, not the indoor air, but in terms of the products themselves to even before they get into the indoor air. But when we get into some other products like vinyl flooring and things like that, um, I think that I, I would like to understand a little better is maybe a research area. You have to have something on your floor. And carpets can be a really big problem. If you don't have carpets, you're going to have a hard surface. There's going to be trade-offs. What are kind of the least worst options here? Um, so I, I think trying to, you know, and this gets into kind of the systematic approach, not the individual contaminant approach. Um, but I, I think really trying to engage practitioners more with some of what's in products and in the work that I do on standards, maybe you can't get laws passed right away, but it can be easier to get standards like ASHRAE and air quality standards changed to address some of these issues. And that can be a foot in the door. So that would that be that's I think one of the things that I'm thinking of is how to start changing ASHRAE standards that I'm a committee member for to address some of the issues about products that I've heard in these last couple of days. We believe, Paul, our committee member, Dr. Paul, um, sorry, Bill Banfleth, would talk a lot about these um, ASHRAE perspectives as well and guidelines. Um, before we go to Dr. Carter for your perspectives, we have one more question or comment from the room. Please go ahead. Thank you very much. Again, um, thank you for the opportunity to be here and, and learn from you. Um, 
I think for me, um, over the last couple of years, um, and specifically perhaps the last few months, is you know when I enter spaces like this, is to ask who was missing, who or what was missing from these conversations and very critical conversations about change, right? And so um, just kind of thinking through about this incredible institution that the National Academies is, is how can this institution, very much like professional organizations like the American Chemical Society, um, the Society for Environmental Toxicology and Chemistry and others that are really leaders in the space of environmental toxicology and chemistry, what is their role, right? And where do these organizations actually fit? Um, and how do we as members of those institutions challenge the status quo and say, we have to do differently. Um, we have to open up these spaces a little bit um, wider for um, many of the people that we spend the last two days talking about um, instead of talking with. Um, and how, you know, how do we more deliberately go about um, um, doing those things? And so how do we bring in um, some of the people who had the very experiences instead of hearing um, from a slide um, what they may or may not have said, even the, the photographic, you know, those experiences and inviting them in. Um, we talk about engaging young people. This is an excellent forum, I think. Um, to bring some of those young people that that will work in and, and really hearing directly from them about their experiences. Um, and I think bringing students of color to walk through spaces so like the National Academies of Science um, can transform lives, right? And so, um, you know, overall for me, it's just continuing to question um, who or what is missing from these conversations um, and leveraging what we learn and taking it back. Um, and then more practically with the question from the, the postdoc or the students online around um, how I can contribute, how I can get into the spaces. You know, I work with neighborhood associations that have you know, not very, they're not organized, right? They're not 501c3s, which is where we're talking about funding. Um, some of them are um, fiscally sponsored organizations. And that's a, you know, those are groups that we didn't even touch on um, here in terms of supporting the work that they're doing literally on the front lines, sometimes um, on fences of chemical plants, right? And they live day in and day out of, you know, not only the outdoor space, but these materials and, and chemistries enter in their spaces. Um, so there are a number of organizations, um, including the EPA, uh, with, with opportunities where um, student scientists, um, faculty members, and others can volunteer time and work as a technical advisor on a specific question with a number um, of organizations. And I can share the links with, with Linda and maybe if, if that's a good way to go about it, I'm not sure that it can be passed on to, to those folks online who were asking. Thank you. Perhaps we can go to Dr. Carter for your perspectives as well. Sure. Um, so first, I don't know who the the most recent speaker was at the mic, but I just want to say how much I appreciate the um, comments, uh, especially around uh, not Sorry, just- Dr. Carter, we'll interrupt you for one second. Oh, sure, yeah. Um, Please I'm introduce sorry. yourself. I'm sorry, my name is Laurel Royer. From which organization? Oh, I, I have my own consulting and environmental and human health firm called Carrying Out Consulting and Research, and I'm based in Atlanta. Thank you so much. Dr. Carter, please go ahead. Yeah, well, th thank you very much for your comment, um, you know, asking around who's missing. I, I think um, that's always an important question to reflect on as we think about what's emerged as themes. I mean, I think you already pointed out a number of um, ways in which engagement in this kind of forum it is it certainly appears to be easier for um, people that operate in research institutions or organizations that are large and work at the interface with communities and not necessarily community members themselves. Um, in the last few years, as we've been adapting to, you know, the disruptions uh, of in-person gatherings, your question or your comment brings to mind um, if I may, 
my own reflections on what is the value of this kind of forum and what would it look like if we did it differently to maybe address some of those gaps. Um, and of course, I shouldn't say of course, but what comes to mind is sort of a more um, a comical or silly group of troubadours like going to different places, um, maybe Morgan State University that you know Ruth Ann mentioned, where instead of trying to bring everybody to a central location that has a certain look and feel, um, what would it look like if we were, um, you know, going to smaller venues, doing things a little bit more in interpersonally or, you know, um, yeah, what would it look like? And that, that's just something that came to mind as you were talking. And I just really appreciate that your comments that, you know, spur that sort of thinking in me and and, and how I conduct my work and maybe um, work with others in this space. Um, I don't know, Rima, if you, if you want, if there are other questions in the room, I don't want to take the floor. I had a thought from Dr. Nyon's question about what would I do next, but I don't know that it's relevant right now. Please, we'd love to actually hear from you um, on what you would do next or differently, let's say tomorrow, based on the workshop and your perspectives. And if there are no more comments afterwards, we might close. Up, but please go ahead, Dr. Carter. Sure. Yeah, I don't see any additional questions. I know there is just from a more logistics standpoint, a question around whether the Q&A um, questions and responses will be recorded or, or disseminated in some way. And so that maybe that's something that afterwards um, our NAS EM team can, can address. Um, I did appreciate the question about what to do next. And, uh, and Rima, I think you made the comment, you know, we can't do everything. Uh, I, I'm sure anyone, no matter what perspective they're coming from, may feel that way. You know, there's There are more things to do than what they might be capable of as an individual. So I'll couch my comment or my thought in response to the question about what I would do next is really uh, you know, narrowly scoped into the position that I hold, which is at a research institution, a university, a public university, and as a faculty member, um, so that that's a pretty narrow perspective. Um, but from that perspective, I think what I have maybe reinforced through this workshop is a desire, just very simply, to to do more qualitative based research. I think um, I I can probably come up with a long list of reasons why it feels really difficult in my job to align the incentives of my job with the things that I think are important. But there are aspects of my current position that I think afford flexibility. And one of those is in how I choose to conduct research. I think something I've heard repeatedly here that, you know, I can say I, I know and maybe even have practiced a little bit, but haven't really leaned in on is um, the, you know, regular engagement to learn what people are thinking about experiencing in their homes. Um, you know, despite recognizing that that homes are a place of diverse needs being met. Um, I've almost always gained entrance into a home by carrying an indoor air quality monitor of some kind. <laughs> and so uh, I come with the frame of, I'm going to measure something that I think is important. And I haven't asked even before that entrance, whether they think that's important. Um, and so I think something I'm excited about in this, like following this workshop and also at the stage of career I'm at, is you know the opportunity to be a bit more expansive in how I conduct my research so that I can hopefully um, learn more about what what would be worthwhile to pursue so that when there is research knowledge to transfer, there are people that actually want <laughs> the findings um, that um, that I've developed because they've been co-developed um, with our you know with 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 people who've already given a lot of thought to what it is that they would like to know about their homes and how to make them safe places for them and their families to live. Thank you so much, Dr. Carter. Dr. Middlestead, please. Um, in closing, I wanted to add something that I haven't been able to really share um, the last day and a half, which is um, the the program that we do that I'm most proud of is called our Air Matters Toolkits and our Smoke Matters Toolkits. And they 
um, tribes and local communities have distributed almost 3,000 to households. But the reason we created that is that takes away this hierarchical that we are helping and that we are knowing and that that the communities we're helping don't have their knowing. And it's saying, here are toolkits, here's a lead and a radon and a green cleaning and mold and moisture and a CO detector and a hygrometer. And to engage and empower the members of those households to say, oh, I can potentially measure the presence of a contaminant or a hazard. And again, that's not trying to teach. We learn and activate best when we do our own search, right? And when we acquire the knowledge ourselves, it's sort of this basic model. And so the idea behind our toolkits is that people will begin to ask questions. What is in my home? How is it related potentially to my health or my parents or my child? Um, so I always wanted, I guess I just keep thinking about how do we keep the individuals at the forefront of our thinking and that as many other speakers more eloquently said, we learn from them and we build and design programs. We meet them with our science or, or our solutions, and then we learn from them and then we meet and, and calculate something. So just wanted to add that. And, and just thanks so much to the academies, to Dr. Habra, um, Dr. Carter, Dr. Stapleton for the planning committee and, and all the people here who I just would continue to love and listen to for days or could listen to. So much, Dr. Middlestead. Very grateful to you. Um, I would like to give one final opportunity for anyone online to please chime in, raise a hand, ask a question if you'd like. Mary Patrick has shared that HUD has a healthy home program. Yes. Are they receiving the report so they can integrate it? Also, there's a lot of research done on dangerous consumer products and how they affect health that can be used as an educational tool. Thank you so much for sharing those links, Mary Patrick. Uh, and I'm pretty sure with our wonderful planning committee and our speakers, the report is being shared. Um, Carter, any final thoughts or should we close up the workshop? Uh, no, I, just my final thought is just a thank you very much to our speakers who I feel like we're um, you know, very willing to to showcase a diverse range of their work, and um, I really appreciate the perspectives that were shared and the conversations that um, you know ensued. So thank you very much, and it's a pleasure working with you all. Thank you so much. And with that, I would like to also add my thanks, my tremendous thanks to Dr. Middlestead for your wonderful, wonderful contributions to making this a huge success in my humble opinion. Uh, Dr. Carter, Dr. Heather Stapleton, who couldn't be with us today because of an urgent commitment. Um, but thank you so much as our planning committee. I'm very proud of what we've been able to accomplish today and really hope that we can continue kind of with this work and conversation together. I know I learned a ton of new kind of knowledge and wisdom from our speakers. Um, thank you for being here with us in person and for everyone online for attending and speaking and engaging with us these two days. I would like to also remind folks um, to please be on the lookout and mark your calendars for our next dissemination workshop from this indoor chemistry report and, and study. This will be also at the National Academy's building on October 18th, and it will discuss the state of funding for indoor chemistry research. And as we sort of really got into the depth of the conversation here today, it's such an important sort of um, grounding force, right, in terms of moving the field forward, not just in the research, but also in the implementation sphere, uh, as we discussed extensively. I would also like to thank Dr. Linda Nyon for leading us in this mission of hosting and planning this dissemination workshop, our wonderful study committee and partners in, in even getting the report out. We all worked on it through COVID and, and I have to say, I really appreciated that time and that connection and learning from all the experts